You are watching lecture 22 uh, of ZOO 3649, University of Venda, um, and I am Professor Moodley. So today we're going to conclude our section on population genetics, and I'm going to leave you with the third null model that has dominated uh, our field. Okay. Um, and you're not unfamiliar with models now. You know what a model is. We first discussed which model of population genetics, our null model to show whether we have evolution or not, right? That was, that was, that was Hardy Weinberg. You got it. Then we came with the right Fisher population, right? That was the next model. And what was that model supposed to do? That model was supposed to help us figure out how much genetic drift, specifically genetic drift, is affecting the population, allele frequencies. How is genetic drift causing evolution? Okay, That was the purpose of a right fissure. The neutral theory brings another model. Okay, And at the end of this model, of this lecture, you will see that we can use the neutral theory as a null model, the same way you, we used the Wright Fisher and the Hardy Weinberg, except this neutral theory provides a beautiful null model to test for which force. Not drift, because that's what the Wright Fisher is doing. This neutral theory allows you give you a null model to test for selection. And that is why the neutral theory is still the holy grail of population genetics because it allows you to try to look for those, that effect that Mr. Darwin told us about 200 years ago. Okay, It al allows us to search the parts of the genome where Mr. Darwin's theory is holding. In other words, that parts of the genome with high fitness or low fitness where natural selection is operating. Okay, so uh, uh, that is why we have the new, that's why the neutral theory is so important. And I'm going to unpack the neutral theory to, for you today. So let's think about this. So before this neutral theory, okay, what did we know about population genetics? Okay. So this, the neutral theory came in the 1960s, okay? So before 1960, nobody actually had any idea how much variation there was in a population, how much genetic variation. Because why? There was no actual way to measure the genetic variation directly, okay? You could only measure it by looking at the phenotype, okay? You can look at pink flowers, blue flowers, and so on, but you could not get the DNA and look at what the DNA is saying, okay? Because we didn't know how to do it in 1960. The structure of DNA wasn't even known by that stage. Remember Watson and Crick and so on, okay? It was during this time, okay? So not much was actually known about DNA, about the genetic variation. So in light of this time where we didn't know how much variation there really is in the genome or in populations, Everybody believed that natural selection was the main driving force behind evolution. Let me say that again. Everybody believed that natural selection, Mr. Darwin's theory, was the main reason that evolution happens. The main force that is changing allele frequencies in a population from one generation to the next. That is what people believed. Because evolution was still very much something that was associated with Darwin's idea of selection, natural selection, sexual or natural selection. Okay, so remember, the other forces of evolution were not really, I mean, Wright came with genetic drift years before the 1960s, right? Already in the 1920s, 30s, he came with the idea of genetic drift. But nobody thought that drift could play such an important role. Nobody thought that drift could play a more important role than selection. I mean, after all, right? It's survival of the fittest. That is what natural selection is saying. And that is how evolution works. So in the 60s and before, everybody had the idea, the mindset, which is incorrect, 
the mindset that everything in evolution happened because of natural selection. Okay. And that led to two schools of thought. Both schools relied on natural selection. So there's the classical school, right, that believed that selection was purifying selection. We remember we've talked about purifying selection in the prax. You're going to be talking about purifying selection in assignment two. Okay, so when you see purifying selection here in the lecture, please don't be surprised. What is purifying selection? Purifying selection is selection against who? The homozygous recessive. Okay, this guy here that has a homozygote for both alleles. Here's allele one on chromosome one on top, chromosome two at the bottom. You got a plus for both, that means you got the same allele for both. That means you're homozygous, right? So, <coughs> and here's one heterozygous, but most of them are homozygous. So that balance, the, the school of purifying selection, okay? So the classic school was the school of purifying selection. And they said that the homozygous recessive will always be removed from the population. Okay, and they said that you will find, find most of the alleles are homozygous, but because the recessive allele has been purified, it's homozygous for the fittest allele, which is the dominant, which is why you got plus. All of these are homozygous plus, 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 because it's the dominant allele. The minus is the recessive allele, right? And you see this one heterozygote here with a minus. And why is that? Remember, we had a chocolate for this in the prac. It's because even when you have strong purifying selection against the homozygote recessive, the heterozygote always keeps the recessive allele in the population. Okay? So, the classical school believed that selection purified the population for all those homozygous alleles. There will be one or two remaining, thanks to the heterozygotes. But most individuals should be homozygous for the fittest allele, in other words, the dominant allele. Okay? That's the classical school. Now, the, uh, that, and that's a selection, but that's purifying selection. They believed in purifying selection. However, there was another school that believed, the balanced school that believed in what? Balancing selection. And you know from the practical that purifying selection and balancing selection are doing different things, aren't they? Purifying selection is reducing the variation. It's classical selection. The fittest allele is the one that remains. Whereas balancing selection, it's doing what? It's always keeping both alleles in the population. It's keep, keeping big A and small A. Why? Because the heterozygote has a high fitness. Always. The heterozygote is giving that small A to the next generation. Okay? So balancing selection, then what would you expect to see when you believe that most of the evolution is happening through balancing selection. What will you have? You will have then more heterozygotes in the population. Okay, because balancing selection favors heterozygotes. So most of the loci in the genome, here's the two chromosomes of the genome, will be different to each other. Here at this locus A, it will be one and three. At locus D, it's four and five. At locus E, it's three and five. Okay, you see that? So most of these alleles are different. Mum gave a different one to dad. So that's heterozygous. And that's what balancing selection is. But remember, both of these schools were selection schools. Okay? This was before the neutral theory. Everybody thought it must be Mr. Darwin's idea that's, that's, that's causing all this evolution. It's either... Mr. Darwin's idea in a purifying way, so purifying selection, or in a balancing way, balancing selection. But one way or the other, these guys thought, nah, -uh, it has to be natural selection. So, then the 1960s came, and then the very first molecular marker came onto the market, okay? And that was isozymes. They weren't actually DNA. Isozymes are proteins, right? Uh, proteins with different isoforms and then you can s see for the first time whether for a particular protein an individual is has a homozygous so two of the same isoforms or heterozygous isoform so you actually get you actually get genetic data because you know if you have two protein isoforms then you if you that's 
translated, remember central dogma, go back up, you go from protein, you go backwards to RNA, you go backwards to DNA. So if the proteins have a difference, a heterozygote, it means the DNA is also heterozygote. So they could use proteins to figure out the DNA variation, okay, genetic variation. So once they figured out this, it seemed that, it seemed that the variation found was very high in the genome, okay? So the first genetic data showed that the genetic data was very high in the genome, not low. So let's go back to the next past slide. What does that mean? High genetic variation means these guys are probably right. Low genetic variation means these guys are probably right. So immediately now you're seeing they found high variation after the first molecular data came. And that was seems to be what? It seemed to be a victory for the balancing selection school. They thought, ha, there's a lot of variation in the genome thanks to this data we've got now. And that means what? Balancing selection is what is the driving force of evolution. However, they were woefully wrong about that. And that is what the neutral theory is all about. When, when, when they started looking more deeply at the amount of variation in the genome, thanks to isozymes, how, many, how much heterozygosity there is across the genome, how many different alleles there are across the genome, it started slowly becoming clear that the variation in the populations that they were observing, now that they could actually get genetic data, was much, much larger than what could be explained by balancing selection. In other words, there was so much variation that balancing selection by itself was unable to create that variation. And why? Why do we know that the amount of variation was too much to be explained by balancing selection? It comes from the idea of segregational load. Okay? Now, this was introduced as an, one of the more elegant things that have happened in population genetics. And elegance means simple but profound at the same time. Okay? And that was uh, what a man named Kimura discovered. Okay? So, when you talk about load, okay, in terms of genetics, like genetic load or segregational load, load is, is a burden. You know when you carry a heavy load on your back, it's a burden to you, isn't it? Because it's heavy and you have to walk a long way with that thing. And you don't know if you're going to break down before you get to your destination because that load is heavy on your back, okay? So when in a population, you don't want the genes or the genomes of those individuals in the population to be loaded with a heavy burden. You want those genomes to be light without a burden so that they can be free to evolve into the future. You do not want the load to get very high. Okay? And how does the load become very high? Hi. When we're talking about load, the burden, what are we talking about in terms of genetics? We are talking about recessive lethal alleles. Okay, We're talking about alleles which are lethal. So if you have it, that gene doesn't work. And when you have two copies, homozygous, you don't have any copy of that gene that works. You die. Or you, you get a very terrible phenotype. Right? You, your fitness is very low. So that's what we call lethal, a lethal allele. So basically, lethal alleles is what creates a load, a burden. So the more lethal alleles you have in the population, the higher the load on that population. The more chance that 
two of those little alleles will come together in the same individual, in a homozygous, and that individual will die. Okay? So when there's a big number of recessive lethal alleles in the population, we say that the genetic load of that population is very high. Okay, so what is the segregational load? Remember, load is talking about recessive alleles, the burden, because it's a recessive allele is a burden. It's keeping you down. It's, al it's not allowed, it's, it's going to kill you when they come together in the homozygote. So you don't want those things anywhere in the population. You want purifying selection to get rid of as many of those as you can, as it can. And you want that, that heterozygote that carries that recessive allele to be few in the population. You don't want too many of those heterozygotes in the population. Because that means every generation, you have segregation of the two heterozygotes. And what happens? When the heterozygote genotype segregates during meiosis, what does it segregate into? Big A, small A. Remember, small A is lethal. If you get small A together with another small A, lethal, you die, right? So segregation of the heterozygote genotype creates a situation. Remember, in balancing selection, what do we have? Everybody's a heterozygote. Let's go back to the slide, right? Here's balancing selection here. Everyone is a heterozygote. You don't, you have mainly heterozygotes in the population, different alleles for both, for, the, for a single locus, right? Different alleles. So if everybody is a heterozygote, big A, small A, right? Then what happens? Big A, small one heterozygote mates with another heterozygote because they're only heterozygotes in that population under balancing selection. They will be mainly heterozygotes because heterozygotes get an advantage. So if you have only heterozygotes in the next generation, one heterozygote will come and meet another heterozygote. And what will happen when they mate? Segregation of the two parental alleles. So the one heterozygote has got big A, small a. Okay, he's actually fine. The small a is not lethal for him because the big A is working and it makes enough dosage to mask the small a, right? But once the alleles segregate into gametes and the same for the dad, big A, small a, segregate into big A and small a in the gametes and now you are unlucky enough to get a small a from mum and a small a from dad. Okay? What's going to happen to you? That's, those, that's now the lethal condition. You're dead. Okay? So, when you have a population under balancing selection, only maintaining diversity, what's going to happen? They're going to be mainly heterozygotes. And every time a heterozygote, two heterozygotes mate, one quarter is going to be what? One quarter is going to be homozygous recessive dead so that means if you assume that selection is the same okay uh, uh, if you assume that frequencies are the same then with each with uh, 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 with each next generation just due to balancing selection you should lose 25% of the population because heterozygotes are always going to mate and every time a heterozygote mate, we have a 25% chance that what? You will get small a, small a coming together and that one dying. Okay? Because of the lethal alleles coming together in the, in the homozygote configuration. So, that means that segregation of the two heterozygote gametes introduces a massive burden to the population. And what is that burden? That burden is every generation, you're going to get 25% dead in the population for every locus in the genome. The clever ones amongst you are already saying, ah, I corner, balancing selection is not going to work. Balancing selection just creates too much of a genetic burden, too much segregational load to keep that population alive. Okay? Now let's look at... <clears throat> whether um, you have 
select when you have a situation where you have selection coefficients okay you can work out segregational load okay from the selection coefficients so this is now a more complex situation than i just told you where there's no selection coefficient in every generation when you mate two heterozygotes with each other you get what 25 percent homozygotes right but let's just say there's actually a selection coefficient operating on top of those genotypes okay and the selection coefficient uh, s here can be worked out from the selection coefficient of the two homozygotes the the the, the dominant homozygote and the uh, lethal homozygote okay and in this situation we have got a segregational load of 0 0.11 this means that even when you have these fit uh, these different um, uh, co selection coefficients uh, different fitnesses on the genotypes even when you have that it still means that thanks to balancing selection okay 11 percent of the population is going to die every generation because of segregational load on this particular locus all right you're getting that so even balancing selection cannot maintain the observed amount of genetic variation that we are seeing, that, that the scientists in the 60s were seeing as new genetic studies start to bring data into the... They say, oh, there's a lot of data, uh, variation. Balancing selection must be the, the winner here. The balanced school has won. Uh-oh. No, it didn't win. Because balancing selection brings a segregational load a burden on the population and every locus has a segregational load okay because they're lethal alleles in every locus now how many loci are there that that have genes in the human genome between 20 and 30,000 okay so now you think about it for one locus let's just take this example here for one locus not 20,000 of them just for one of them 11% of the population has to die if balancing selection is 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 the force of evolution that keeps genome diversity clearly balancing selection cannot keep that diversity in the genome because if 11 percent die for this locus how many are going to die for the next locus and the next locus and remember there are 20 to thirty thousand loci if each one loses 11 percent Within one generation, you have no population. Everybody is dead. So that's why balancing selection cannot explain this. Okay? Clearly, natural selection could not explain the variation in the genome. Okay? So, what other evolutionary force was playing such a strong role in maintaining genome evolution? Finally, we are making progress. We are making progress in understanding what's going on in evolution okay we are making progress and we have come to the point now in the early 1960s where we can see that natural selection is not cutting the mustard mr darwin's idea is a great idea but it is not the main force of evolution keeping genomes variable that was a bombshell to these classical and balancing guys because it meant neither of them was correct. Okay? You will be asked about segregational load in tests, exams. You have to explain it. What is segregational load? It is the burden that a population has to bear under balancing selection when heterozygotes are segregating. And then you have the chance, because of that segregation, for those two small A's to come together. <laughs> Bang! Dead. Lethal. Okay? And that's what segregational load is all about. Okay, so that brings us now to the neutral theory. This man, this Japanese man here, Mutu Kimura, is probably one of the most famous geneticists that ever lived. And one of the most famous guys in evolution. You know, there's Darwin, there's Mendel, there's Wright, there's Fisher. We've, talk, we've talked about all of them. They should be all familiar guys to you now. Now, and Hadi Weinberg, right? Now we got the new a new kid on the block and not some guy from a Western country like America or England or so on. 
Germany. This is a guy from an eastern country, a Japanese man. And he came and he shocked the world with his idea of segregational load. Kimura was the one who said, uh-uh, you see, we have the segregational load. There is no way balancing selection can be maintaining the evolution of the molecular evolution of the genome. Okay? In 1968, he came up with his neutral theory. Okay? And that dropped a bomb on the world of molecular evolution. Nothing has remained the same since. Okay? He solved that problem of balancing selection and segregation load by simply saying that, uh uh, the majority of the mutations in the genome are neutral. Finished. The majority. What is neutral? It means there's no fitness. Okay? There's no selection on them. They don't they are not favored, they don't have a high fitness, and they're not disfavored. They don't have a low fitness. So they're neutral. They have their fitness is zero. Okay? Selection doesn't see those places in the genome where that are neutral. Selection can't see them. They are bl blind to selection because they have no fitness, those parts of the genome. And he is saying that the majority of the genome was neutral. That means they had no fitness. Of course, most of the people from the balancing school and the, and the, and the other schools of selection were jumping up and down. They said, no way, man. You can't, you can't be serious. But he was. Okay? Because, and he said, if I'm right, then natural selection cannot be the major driving force of evolution. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is, was a big, big, big statement to make. Okay? For this small Japanese man to say to all those guys that came before, the selectionist guys, that was a big statement to make. So, if they've got no selection happening on them, Kimura said, the majority of the genome is evolving randomly through genetic drift. And that is what the neutral theory is saying. That the majority of the genome of any animal or plant or whatever you organism you're looking at, the majority of the genome evolved through genetic drift and not natural selection. Can you imagine the fury this idea created? Okay, so let's unpack the details of the neutral theory. Okay, so the rate of evolution, okay, the rate at which new mutations come into the population has got nothing to do with the size of the population. It has to do with the rate of mutation. Okay, so the neutral theory takes this mutation into account. Okay, it takes into account mutation, random mutations. Okay, um, so it takes that force of evolution into account. But the average time for a mutation, mutation to drift to either fixation, okay, or to loss. So another allele becomes fixated, right? So drifting, you see those populations, we've done the simulations, where you see the population, each generation, it's going up, down, up, it's going slightly up, it's going down, it's drifting, okay? That population is drifting thanks to genetic drift, and it wants to go up, or it wants to go down. Going to the top or to the bottom means what? fixation right it wants to become fixed but the population size is preventing it from becoming fixed if the population size is big then that will only just drift in the around the middle if the population size becomes small what happens it'll go up or down it'll fix the mutation so the time how many generations it takes to fix to go all the way up all the way down that time okay is dependent on the population size okay so four times ne generations okay so how much how many generations the ne is say maybe if the effective size is 20 then it will take four times 20 80 generations for the average for that allele to go either to the top or go to the bottom okay fixed or lost so that is the average so the time it takes for drift to fix an allele 
is dependent on the population size. But the rate at which new mutations come into the population is independent of the population size. It's only dependent on the mutation rate. So in other words, mutation rate, so one force of the mutation force of evolution is independent from the drift force of evolution. So at any given time, Kimura said that there are thousands, probably even millions, of neutral alleles drifting randomly through the population with no fitness. No balancing selection, no purifying selection, no selection at all. Okay? And that is how the genome can have so much variation. That is how the genome can have so much variation. So the role of selection in the neutral theory is only to purify deleterious mutations in essential genes. Okay? To purify lethal alleles. Okay? That's the only role of selection. So, basically, the only role is purifying. That's what Kimura said. The role of fixing, for example, selection, selecting the fittest allele and then pushing that allele to fixation. Kimura said, mm -mm. that role of selection, the one we all want, the one Darwin talked about, where selection of the fittest, that role is actually not a big role for selection in, the, in, in, in true evolution, in the, in, in the evolution of the genome. Okay, so he, instead of evolution being the thing that creates the evolution, Mr. K uh, Professor Kimura reduced the, the, the significance of natural selection to just a minor role. And all it's doing is just if the, if the lethals come together in the, in, the, in the homozygote, kill them. Okay, they don't, they don't have high fitness. They're lethal. Kill them. That's the only thing selection does. It kills off those lethal. Pur it purifies. Okay? Whereas in the old days, we were saying, no, selection is the one that's driving evolution. It's, it's the survival of the fittest allele. And Kimura is saying, that fittest allele, nonsense. Okay? It's all happening thanks to genetic drift. Okay? And it's quite clear because if we do have to have the fittest allele or the fittest genotype, like in, as in balancing selection, then the genome would have much less variation than what it is because of segregational load. Balancing selection, no selection actually can explain all the variation that we have in the genome. Okay, so the important neutral parameter theta, okay, is equal to 4. Always four because we've always got four gametes segregating. Two in mum and two in dad. Okay? And always four times the effective size, in other words, drift, power of drift, times mu, which is the mutation rate. So four NE mu has become then this neutral parameter. And the neutral theory, therefore, takes drift and mutation and creates a null model, an expectation for what allele frequencies should be under this neutral model. They should always be in a balance. NE is reducing, so drift is reducing the amount of variation, and mu, mutation, is bringing it back. Just the same way migration brings it back in Wright's Island model. Okay, but in this one, we are talking about the balance between drift and mutation, not migration. Okay, for any mu. All right, so based on this, we can use this theory as our new null model. Okay, if it is, we should see, if it's correct, we should see the following predictions. We should see a constant rate of sequence evolution, a molecular clock. We're going to get into this in, in honors. And there should be an inverse relationship between neutral mutation rate and the degree of functional constraint acting on a gene, such that the functionality constrained genes evolve at a lower mutation rate than the neutral mutation rate. So let's just unpack that for, for, for a moment. Okay, So the neutral theory is saying that in the parts of the genome with 
essential genes. In other words, that are functionally constrained. That's what functional constraint means. It means you can't just have a mutation in that gene. And you will, because why? You will create a lethal allele. The gene will stop working and you will create a lethal allele if you just have a mutation in that gene. So what happens in that situation? Kimura says, no, no, no. In that situation, selection is coming. He's playing a minor role and he's getting rid of that lethal genotype. Okay, he's purifying the population from that lethal genotype. But what happens then when you keep purifying the population of that lethal genotype? In that piece of DNA where you keep purifying, the rate of mutation will, see, will seem to be much less compared to the rate of mutation outside a, cons a, a essential part of the genome. Okay, which is the neutral mutation rate. The mutation rate in the part of the genome that has no selection will be much higher than the, than the mutation rate inside this gene where selection is purifying the lethal alleles. Okay? Because you won't see all the mutations because many of those mutations are lethal and you don't record them because they're dead. Therefore, the rate appears to be lower in those areas. You need to understand that. You need to understand that. All right. So if we look at the molecular clock, we actually see that without selection and without the influence of size of the population, right, the rate of molecular evolution should be constant. Okay? So the rate of evolution should be constant in a world where there is no selection and where there is limited genetic drift, okay, where the size of the population is big. So you should see that the number of mutations increases as time increases, and it increases in a st straight line. So in other words, the neutral, th the neutral theory predicts that most of the genome is going to evolve according to a clock-like rate of mutation. Tick, tock, tick, tock, another mutation. Tick, tock, tick, tock, another mutation. Tick, tock, tick, tock, another mutation. And because of that constant clock-like um, addition of new mutations, what we can do with this molecular clock is then figure out between two genomes how many mutations are there and if we know the rate at which the mutations occur because of this tick-tock, tick-tock, then we can say what? How much time has gone by since those two genomes shared a common ancestor? And that is where the molecular clock becomes very important. It is, allows you to go back in time and figure out when in time two species or two populations became different. When did human beings, us, diverge from chimpanzees okay you can figure that out using a molecular clock how many mutations in humans how many mutations in chimpanzees okay and how how much time does it take for those mutations to be generated and that's the time at which humans and chimps share a common ancestor so you see how powerful the molecular clock is okay but not all parts of the genome mutate at the same rate okay there is actually quite a lot of variation in the rate of mutation, okay? And that is because we have these functional constraints, okay? Uh, as I explained to you, the functional constraints. So this says here, okay, the synonymous mutations, those are the mutations that do not have a change in amino acid. It does not affect the protein at all, even though there's a mutation. The synonymous rate of mutation, okay, their synonymous mutations are neutral. They don't change the phenotype. Selection doesn't see them, okay? They are neutral. Look at the rate at which they occur, okay? At a very high rate. And then you look at the non-synonymous mutations, okay? Those are the mutations that do change the phenotype. Those are the mutations that selection sees. Because once you change the, the protein, now either the protein works better or it works worse. Or it becomes lethal. It, it becomes non-functioning at all. Then it becomes a lethal allele. As soon as a non-synonymous mutation happens, selection can see it. Because the protein has been changed. The amino acid, one at least one amino acid has been changed. Suddenly, selection can see it. And, 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 and it has a fitness. Okay? And so as a result of that, the mutation rate selection prevents the 
mutation rate from being very high in that piece of DNA. And you see, non-synonymous changes happen at a much lower rate. Remember, rate is the slope. So the slope is, is, is a heavy slope, steep slope, the rate is high. If the slope is a shallow slope, the rate is low, okay? So that's those are the predictions of the neutral theory. Okay, so I just want to conclude um, in these last slides that um, there are many parts of the genome that code for proteins, okay? So there are actually m many parts of the genome that don't fit the neutral theory, okay? And how do we know that they don't fit the neutral theory? Because the rates of mutation are not what we would expect under the neutral theory. At, under the neutral theory, we would expect that rate, that slope. Okay? So when you don't find that, when you find a slope that is significantly different to that, to that slope, like this one, look how much different that one is to that one. What can you say? You can say that these mutations here, these mutations here, do not fit the neutral expectation. They do not fit what we expect due to the neutral theory. Okay? So, and this is here what we expect due to the neutral theory. So this is not what we expect due to the neutral theory. And if what we ex get is really different, significantly different to what we expect, we are now using the neutral theory as a null model to test for selection. Because if what you get from a piece of DNA is not what you expect according to the neutral theory, then you can say very um, convincingly that that part of the genome is under natural selection. Okay? You see how powerful the neutral theory is and why it is a null model to test for selection. We look at a piece of DNA and we say, is this DNA fitting our neutral theory, our neutral expectation, what we expect according to Kimura's neutral theory. If it doesn't, we got a way of saying that natural selection is happening on this part of the DNA. Okay? And that is the, the essence of the neutral theory, theory. Okay? And there are many parts of the genome, like MHC, uh, immune, immune genes, uh, HIV envel envelope proteins, okay, that have a higher rate of non-synonymous changes than the rate of synonymous changes, okay, which show not just not just purifying selection. So the rate of these parts of the genome are even higher than the neutral rate, not lower, like purifying selection. Purifying selection makes it lower. This, these ones are higher, okay? And that's telling you that, yes, there is a little bit of positive selection happening in the genome. So Professor Kimura was not 100% right when he said that there is no positive selection. Only selection is purifying selection, okay? There are parts of the genome where the slope is higher than neutral expectation. And that's telling you what? That positive selection, not purifying, purifying will be lower. Positive will be high. Positive selection is happening on that piece of DNA. And that has led to what we call the near neutral theory, okay? Which was basically a compromise that added these things that I've told you. And the near neutral theory is now what allows us to test, uh, to use the neutral theory as a uh, null model to test for selection. Okay? Because the molecular clock didn't tick perfectly, there was evidence for positive selection, and that the near neutral theory says that all non-coding DNA, which is most of them DNA in the, in the genome, and synonymous mutations are neutral, but non-synonymous sites are not strictly neutral. They can have a slight advantage 
which means that they are uh, they will have a higher rate of mutation or they can have a slight disadvantage which means that they have a slightly lower rate of mutation compared to the neutral rate okay and in and and in that way we say that they are near neutral but one way or the other we are able sorry we are able to use this neutral theory to test a piece of dna to see whether it is showing the pattern expected due to neutrality or whether it's rejecting the hypothesis of neutrality in favor of a hypothesis of selection okay so that leaves us with the major tenets of the modern uh, uh, modern synthesis which i'm just going to go over but you know this already and that's basically wrapping up our population genetics section populations must have genetic variation that continually increases through random undirected mutation okay mutation is random they evolve change in little frequencies through drift gene flow migration or selection most adaptive alleles have a slight phenotypic effect so the phenotypic changes are actually gradual okay and diversification becoming different arises by speciation usually occurring after gradual evolution of reproductive isolation we're going to talk more about speciation when in a couple of sections time all right and these processes continue for su sufficiently long if they do then uh, they produce changes sufficient to delineate higher level taxonomic entities it's like species families um, and so on classes so that is basically how evolution on a tiny scale and the four forces of evolution will lead eventually to new species and we're going to unpack that part now we've figured out in population genetics this here okay we figured out that the allele frequencies are changing okay some people call that micro evolution and the and the evolution of different species people call micro macro evolution you would have heard these terms in 2544 you would have heard these terms in first year i'm telling you in third year that there's only one kind of evolution okay micro and macro are basically two ends of the same coin there's only one kind there's no micro and there's no macro there's only one kind of evolution and 3649 brings micro and macro together in a perfect synthesis okay so i will leave it there uh, we're finished with population genetics now. We've got another um, three sections to go. We've got genetic structure coming up next, speciation, and we've got molecular ecology. And we're going to run through those in the next couple of weeks. All right. I will see you for the next lecture, the next section, genetic structure.